I guess we're going to start in Romans 5, but actually what's, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, what I like to say is like skipping a rock. I'm going to skip a rock through Romans 1 through 4, and then we'll uh, probably start around Romans 5 verse 12, actually, as far as actually like reading. So one thing about the Roman letter is this letter preceded Paul's visit to Rome. Paul had not been to Rome, so this was sent before. So when Paul arrived, the people that had received this letter had a very good understanding of the gospel and what the message was. Um, So the Roman letter, especially chapters 1 through 8, is just amazing. Rome gave us basically our legal system. I mean, it all kind of stems from Rome, the, very, the government and legal, uh, judicial aspect of our, uh, of the world society, really at large. And Paul was a, he started out as a law guy. I mean, he he knew the law of God, and he, and the way that Romans is written is very much like a legal thing, very very precise, and leaves no loopholes. It, it's just step by step walking you through what the gospel is and what. Uh, what God's plan is for man. It's quite remarkable. All right, so what I'd like to do, I went through this morning and just wrote down like a couple things uh, that I I would summarize each of these chapters as saying, Romans 1 through 4. It's not to say that you shouldn't read them, but I just just kind of to start in Romans 5 uh, and just go Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. This could be a, a long, slow thing. I don't know, but uh, um, I think it's important to, to to go slow through this because we need to get a hold of what it's saying. But uh, right off the bat in Romans 1, the Apostle Paul declares, the just shall live by faith. I mean, he's written 16 verses, verse 17 of the first chapter. He says, the just shall live by faith. So he's declaring right off, right at the very beginning of this letter that if you want to be just or justified with God, it is going to be entirely based on faith. Nothing else. That's it. Faith. And it says the, re- the rest of Romans 1 tells us that the creation itself is enough evidence to reveal there's a creator. And that what is seen with these eyes is evidence that there's one who is unseen. You can't look at the ocean and the sunrise and plants growing out of the ground and other people. and I mean, you can't look at rivers. You can't look at all this life and everything that's going on this planet and say, it's all an accident. It's all random chance. That's just foolish. <laughs> that's totally foolish. So in Romans 1, it tells us that the visible things are really revealing to us God's invisible attributes. But, even so, man rejected it. And it says that, uh, it says uh, they refused to honor God and they weren't thankful. So they became idol worshipers and God just gave them over to it. Three or four different times in Romans 1 it says, so God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. In other words, mankind persisted in his foolishness and his rejection of God. So God says, okay. And he rejected, and and, uh, again, okay, so you just get what you get. A reaping and sowing factor is brought into play here. You start off not being thankful and honoring God as God, and then it says that uh, God gives them over to impurity, and then it says God gave them over to degrading passions, so now their sex life is all tangled up and, and screwed up in their head. They don't know what they're doing there. And then finally, it says they didn't acknowledge God any longer, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. So eventually, we get totally twisted in our mind, and we start celebrating what God calls sin. Yeah. I mean, if we're rejecting the God who is reality, then we're going to start living in unreality. Right? (laughs) Right? I mean, that's our only other option. 
So then Romans 2 starts to show us how Jews and Gentiles are the same. They're in the same boat. Whether you have the law of God given to you and you go by that because you're Jewish, or whether you never knew anything about the law because you're a Gentile, either way, we're all going to be judged. The Jews are going to be judged according to the law. The Gentiles will be judged according to their conscience. So every human being on the planet has a little bit of a alarm system on the inside. Now, your conscience is not going to be as clear and as to the point as the Ten Commandments possibly. You know, it might not be as clear as that, but it doesn't matter. God's saying, look, follow after this little alarm in here, you Gentiles. You follow after what you do know, and the light will get brighter. You, you will come to know more, right? That's So it says those that die apart from the law will be judged apart from the law. People always like to say, well, Louis, what about people? What about the pygmies in Africa? <laughs> what about those guys? You know, they never heard about Jesus, never saw a Bible. Well, what about them? <laughs> they have they have a little bit of a light inside and that they will get where God wants them to get. I, at some point, you have to trust that he's just and he is trustworthy. It doesn't mean that we don't share the gospel with them. It just means that if there's people that die without ever hearing of Christ, I'm trusting that God is going to be fair to them. And when they stand there and say, well, I didn't know about Jesus. And they said, well, did you steal even though you knew inside it was wrong? Did you lie even though you knew that something was wrong inside when you lied? There was an alarm, but you still did it? Well, generally, people don't think it's good to uh, murder your neighbor. I mean, <laughs> although there are cultures that are okay eating them. <laughs> so we can't, just go by <laughs> we can't just go by that because there are cannibals in the world. <laughs> But uh, ultimately, there is a, there's an alarm system on the inside. So at the end of chapter 2 of Romans, he then brings up circumcision. And he's basically saying that uh, God's view of true circumcision isn't just the Jewish law-keeping version. It is a circumcision of our heart that is done by the cross of Christ. So there's a cutting away of a, the fleshiness of our heart that God is really after. It's not about a physical cutting away of flesh. That was always a picture, an image that was pointing toward the real circumcision of the heart. So then in Romans 3, again declares all of us guilty. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory. But let me show you this. I, I, will want, I do want to read these verses to you because I think they're important. Look at Romans 3, 19 and 20. If you ever, if you, if you're not clear about this, or if you have questions or not real sure, I think this is some of the greatest couple of verses that make this clear of what the law. When I say the law, primarily the Ten Commandments, what it was given for, what God's plan with the law was all about. Uh, you hear these terms a lot where people say, "Well, you're just we don't live according to law; we live according to grace." That's old covenant. This is new covenant. You have, and sometimes it's very fuzzy and mixed up for people. Romans three nineteen and 20 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So it tells us three things about why the law was given. It was to shut our mouth, <laughs> hold us accountable and to give us the knowledge of sin that's the purpose God gave the law for no way, no how was the law given to make us right with God it just wasn't God never ever once thought I'm going to give the law to man and they'll get it right with me because they'll do the law wow. never ever entered God's mind never was the purpose, never was the point ever, ever, ever <laughs> ever God gave the law to reveal to us we aren't God. <laughs> the lie in the beginning with the serpent was if you take of this fruit, you will be as God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. So God says, they all have fallen into this delusion of thinking they're like me. Yeah. So how am I going to get them to wake up to the fact that they're not at all like me? Oh, I'm going to show them in written form who I am. And I'm going to say, if you want to be like me, if you think you're like me, then do this. Right. Yeah. yeah, which is the point, right? So stubborn, delusional mankind says, oh, don't put anything before God. Check. Oh, don't 
bear false witness? All right. Oh, don't commit murder? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. And then Jesus said, wait a second. The, the law says don't commit murder, but I say don't hate. The law says don't commit adultery, and I say don't look at a woman with lust in your heart, for you've already committed adultery. Oh, my gosh. What are we going to do with that? See, Jesus amplified it to make the point clearer. He, he went from codes written on stone out here to what's wrong on the inside of us, which is what we have to come to see. So the law was given to shut our mouths, hold us accountable, and to reveal to us what sin is. That's the purpose of the law. Paul in Galatians called the law our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So the whole point God gave the law for was to get us to see we can't do this to make us cry out for salvation. I can't perform up to this perfect standard. Help, Lord, help me. Oh, Jesus. God goes, hey, oh, wait, oh, look, there's one that's waking up over here. They're walking, they're waking up, they're coming out of their delusion. They realize they're not God, they can't do this, right? So that, that was the purpose of the law. In Romans 4, he tells us, well, then how are we made right then? If, if the law doesn't do it, in the last part of Romans 3, he says there is a justification, though, and it's by Christ. So he says, well, what can we learn about this through Abraham? The Apostle Paul always refers back to Abraham as the example because Abraham lived before the law was given. Hundreds of years before the law was ever given, God declared Abraham righteous. Wow. How in the world does that happen? <laughs> well, God gave Abraham a promise that he was going to make him into a great nation. He was going to give him a seed. And that through him and that seed, all nations, the whole world will be blessed. And Abram said, okay, I believe you. I'll take that promise, and I believe that. He just believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. We, thousands of years later, you have Abraham, let's see, you have Abraham and a promise. Hundreds of years later, you have the Ten Commandments given. And then you have all these years, and then here's Jesus pops up. In, the, in Galatians it says, at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those that are under the law. So in Christ, anybody that puts their faith in Christ is now righteous just like Abraham because we're believing just like him. Not only we're believing just like him, we're believing the same thing as him. Because Galatians says that the promise was to Abraham's seed, not seeds. So it's not Abraham's natural descendants, the Jewish people. It's Abraham's descendants by faith, <laughs> which are those that are placing their trust in the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ. So Abraham believed God about Jesus, not really knowing, I don't think, fully what that meant, but he was believing the seed that was going to come, which is Christ, way before the law, way before the Christ, way before all this stuff. We now, on the other hand, in 2018, are looking back at the virgin birth, the sinless life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and we're placing our faith in the same exact seed of Abraham. That's astounding. <laughs> So we're all looking to the same promise, the same promised one. So when we believe the seed, just like Abraham believed in the seed, we're declared righteous too. Thank you, Lord. By faith, mm -hmm. which goes back to Romans 1, the just shall live by faith. Yep. If you're going to be justified or made right with God, it's only by faith, mm -hmm. not by law keeping or by any kind of efforts on our own, ever, ever, ever. So Romans 4 is telling us all about Abraham and what, and what we can learn about that. Abraham believed God even before he was circumcised. There was no such thing as a Jewish circumcised person when God, when God gave Abraham that promise. Abraham believed God, and after that believing is when God told him to circumcise himself and all the males in his camp. And he said that will be the sign of the covenant. It's not the covenant. It's a sign of the covenant, Right? When we get, become a believer, we get baptized in water. The baptism in water is not salvation. Right. It's a sign 
of salvation. When Tracy and I got married, will you take this woman? Will you take this man? I will. I do. In that moment, we were married. We hadn't even got rings on yet. The rings are a sign of the covenant. The I will in agreement is the covenant. Does that make sense? So we believe God. We're considered righteous. Therefore, we get baptized. (laughs) I'm giving myself to this union in marriage. We're married. Therefore, we wear rings. Right? See what I'm saying? The, the, of an there you go. That, the, the ring doesn't make me married. Lots of people are married, don't wear a ring. Some people are wearing rings that don't act married. <laughs> anyway, we won't get into that. <laughs> we won't get into that. The point being is, is you should be able to see I'm married by this. But this is not what I'm married. This is not what makes me married. It's this commitment, this union that has happened that makes me married one with her. Wow. So, Romans 4. Uh, uh, any written word of God in Abraham's lifetime? Or what was the, was it carried his mouth? I'd say it was probably oral, yeah. The, the society, at, at, by and large, sat by the fire and told stories. Uh, now, there may have been some written stuff. I, I'm really not sure about that. Um, but I would say mostly it was by word of mouth. You know, your great-grandfather. You know, I heard a guy teaching about that one time, and he was talking about Methuselah and how Methuselah, because he was so old, that Enoch, I don't want to get into this too deep, but if you look at all the genealogy in the beginning of Genesis, a lot of those people lived at the same time as others because they lived so long. See, we tend to think, well, this person lived, and, you know, we yeah, you just easily great, dismiss great, great it. Grandchildren living, yeah. yeah, you have great, great, yeah, you have people that would have been able to... Yeah, been able to go visit Methuselah and find out things firsthand that had happened during his lifetime. You know, I mean, that's that'd be pretty remarkable, right? So, so they they remembered the, and, and verbalized the genealogy that yeah. they did verbally, and they remembered all that. You would have to. Yeah. I mean, we don't we can't just Google it. Yeah. They, <laughs> they couldn't just Google it, right? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm a, I'm a I enjoy being able to do that, but I wonder what that's going to do to us yeah. as a whole. You know, our memories, our ability to think for ourselves. And I, I, I just wonder about that sometimes. Because I tell you, sometimes I Google things trying to find commentaries and stuff, and most of them are saying the same thing. I'm like, how can this be? How can four or five totally different commentaries be saying the same thing? What's up with that? You don't have any kind of thoughts or insight of your own on this at all. Kind of scary to me. So a lot of times I, I end up having to ditch the commentaries because I'm just it's something I'm not I'm just not buying this. Something there's something else to this. It's more than what this person is saying. So I end up having to just And you gotta be aware of like fake resources. Yeah, I mean and tr- traditional thought processes and you know I mean, can God really show us the truth without a bunch of so called scholars? Well, I would I think so. <laughs> that's right yeah. so now we're in Romans 5 the first part of Romans 5 is basically saying that we're justified by faith you know after he gave this big long case about Abraham and that's how it works so now whew, I'm already tired <laughs> Romans 5 <laughs> we haven't even got going I'm already getting tired here. Romans 5 verse 12 does someone want to read 12 13 and 14. Three little verses. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of all sin. For until the law was sin, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death resigned reigned. From Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Wow. So, let me say this, too. The, the first four chapters of Romans primarily deals with sins, S-I-N-S, meaning plural, lying, murder, 
homosexuality, all of the, you know, all of these things that people do, right? Behaviors, acts, deeds, sins. Here in Romans 5, 12, we see the word sin, S-I-N, introduced. And there's a very, there's, there's an, it's important to see this because these are not the same thing. Sins and sin in this context are not the same thing. Sometimes we glance over this uh, and we use the terms interchangeably. Well, the Apostle Paul, like I said, he doesn't waste words and he doesn't say things just by mistake. He doesn't gloss over things. He's very purposeful. It's very much like a legal document here to where, you know, later on someone can say, well, but Paul said, and he could say, you're right, I did say. What did I say, though? What did I really say? In Galatians, he just, he just, just distinguishes between seeds and seed when he's talking about Jesus Christ. And he makes a point of the S right there in the text. <laughs> so he's, he's like showing us that this is important. So even the term sins and sin would be the same way. It's important to see this. In the first part of Romans, it says sins, all of these deeds or acts. It would be like the fruit on a tree. But now he's going to the root. Sin produces sins. It's very important to see this. It changes things. And I think it's the key to understanding these chapters. And I think it's the reason why most people don't understand these chapters. That's just my own opinion here. but So we've got to pay attention to this. So one, just as through one man, sin entered into the world. So sin entered into the world. So therefore, all of us die. Right? That's what it says. So I, Brian, who was here last week, what he likes to do, when, like we're at the jail or whatever, is he'll line people up by the wall, but we're not, we're not going to have to do all that. I'll just make the point while we're seated. But we'll say... You're Adam, then you have all these generations of people, right, represented around this table, and, we, and then we get to Moses. So Frankie's Moses. Brandy sinned, Adam sinned, so everybody between her and Moses died, even though there was no law yet given. Isn't that something? No Ten Commandments have been given. Nothing to tell us in written out form, do not kill. I mean, you look at Cain. God didn't take Cain out. He put a mark on him and let him live. See, it says that where, where there, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin's not imputed or accounted towards you when there is no law. But yet, everybody died from Adam to Moses. His point here is, is that we are all suffering and joined to Adam's one sin. One thing, one disobedience that Adam did brought us all death even without any charge of sin against ourselves. I mean, you look at that all the way from Adam to Moses. That's a lot of folks, right? All those people died because of what Adam did. But it wasn't because God could say, you stole and that's why you died. You committed murder and that's why you died. No, nope. it says even those who did not disobey. Did. Yeah, in the same way that Adam yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. so death, the, the point he's making here is he's showing us that all of mankind are joined in Adam. This is, this is his real point. If you look at 14, it says, Death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Look at this last part. Who is a type or a foreshadowing of him who was to come. Yeah. See, he's making a case for how we can be joined to Christ. See, that, that's what he's making the case for. He's saying that look at Adam and how he brought death in. Just like this one man, Adam, can bring death to all of us, he's getting ready to show us another singular man can bring life and righteousness to us. See, he's, he's, he's bringing these two Adams <laughs> to the forefront. That's his point. He's saying, look, there's a union. There's a oneness in fallen man. There's a oneness in raised man. There's a there's a joining here but of us. And we stall start out in Adam, and by faith we can be translated or transferred into the last Adam. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I don't know if they can say it any better than this right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49. 
1 Corinthians 15. Now, this, this part of this chapter, is Paul is discussing what our new spiritual body is going to be like. But anyway, you'll get the point here anyway of what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And then he says, the last Adam, isn't that something? See, he's referring to Christ as a, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. See, we all come into the natural first Adam first, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So that's that's our choices. That's it. <laughs> we can either stay in the earthly fallen Adam and just die, or we can move ourselves over by faith into the heavenly Adam, the last head of the human race that's ever coming, <laughs> and live. I just love how it's just so simple. I mean, it's just so simple. So does somebody want to read? Well, before we go any further, anybody got any thoughts, anything to add to any of this? Well, you mean like he didn't have a choice? You know, I... Why all the Jews can't have it? Yeah. Okay. So, was Adam predestined to do that, so that all men die? But because God knows something doesn't mean that he made it happen, which would be a no-choice thing, Right. Just because he well, knows God something. That it was just, he knew that Adam was going to have that choice in the very life he was going to Well, and here's, I think here, my, my thought on this is that humanity was, was created powerless. But they had to learn that. Mm-hmm. And the only way that we learn that is to be taken over by a power that we don't like. That's the only way we learn it. We can't. We cannot discover powerlessness if everything's going our way. I mean, so God had to. The Bible says, "Look at." Let me show you something again. Romans. Look in Romans eleven. Look at Romans eleven verse thirty-two. Very amazing verse. Romans eleven thirty-two. Where in that chapter he's discussing Gentiles and Jews, and uh, this is kind of a deep subject here. But I'm not trying to get into that right now. But Romans 11.32 says, For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. There's no way we would ever discover who God and what his character really is without kind of rebelling against it. and getting. In Romans 1, he gives them over. You see what I mean? He gave mankind over. He just He's like, look, this is what you think you want. I'm just going to give you over to it. You ever hear someone say, well, you know, uh, they got to get their belly full. You don't. You, your life doesn't change until your belly is full of something sour or bitter or painful. You're not just not motivated to make the move. Yeah, yeah, same idea. Yeah. It's like whenever I, you know, I was so deep in drug addiction, I didn't care about changing until I got in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Something had to shake you away. Yeah. yeah. And that's the way we all are. Yeah. And that's why I think people that get into addiction and all that kind of stuff actually can, in the grand scheme of things, be at an advantage. Because the person that seems to have health, wealth, and, and loving friends and family, you know, it's an illusion. But those people can live longer in the illusion. Yeah. They, they live longer in that delusion. So, whereas the people that are in prison or in rehab or in divorce court or... <laughs> standing in the funeral home looking at their loved ones, those people are more apt to be awakened. Whoa, life is not what I thought it was. You know, I mean... Spend, honestly, until something's actually taken away from us, we still, sometimes those other things aren't enough. Yeah. Right. I know Tracy thought my bottom was the grave. She didn't see there was a bottom. Yeah. Um, and for, unfortunately, some people that's true, right? Some people don't make it. I mean, I... I heard a guy one time, though, back to the whole thing about God, you know, the sin of Adam and all that, is that I heard someone say one time that the devil is still God's devil. That's pretty intense if you think about that. See, Satan is believing a lie himself. He, he believes that he can be like God, which is what he fed humanity. 
which is the reason God gave the law, was to awaken us to that lie, make us realize that is not true, that is not what you're meant to be doing or even attempting to be doing. God created us to be the vessel for his spirit, but like Lucifer, we wanted to be the light instead of the lamp. See, Lucifer wanted to be the light. He wasn't content with containing it. And that's what's happened to mankind. But God, you, another guy, I heard him say that Satan is God. Satan is God's convenient agent. <laughs> God can't lie, but his convenient agent can. See, we, we sometimes elevate Satan as though he's the exact opposite of God. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. God is God. There's none beside him. That's right. There's no rival. So Satan, <laughs> <laughs> so Satan is deceived, and he's got a bunch of people deceived with him. And they think that he's as powerful as God, right? Yeah. And meanwhile, God's going, if you consider my servant Job? <laughs> Satan didn't come to God saying, hey, I found Job. No, God said, have you, Satan, considered Job? Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Jesus was baptized and immediately went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That was God's plan. Adam was in a garden. Somehow a serpent was in there that led him astray. It's God's intention. <laughs> we learn by opposites. We learn something's hot or cold, right? Hot, cold, life, death, male, female, up, down, bitter, sweet, right, wrong. <laughs> Life is full of these opposites. That's the only way we learn. So until we are the prodigal and go the wrong way for a while, we don't miss our father. We don't come to know our need of the Father. And then, according to the prodigal, he came to himself. Bing. The light came on, and he says, I will arise and go back to my Father. <laughs> and what did he do? When he went back, he said, I'll tell him I'm not even worthy to be a son. So the son is coming back to the Father saying, make me a slave, because his mind had changed about how great he was. Yeah. And the Father knowing all along that's my boy, now gives him full authority back because now he's safe. Now he can be trusted. He's gotten the crap kicked out of him, and he realizes his father is the only way. So his mindset is, I'll be a slave. But God says, oh, no, you're my son. Thank you, Jesus. And the plan all along was for you to realize who you are and who I am by way of finding out who you're not. It's amazing. So he went into a far country because God and the father sat on the porch waiting. He didn't go looking for him. Yeah. He, he waited for his son to come to himself after he'd sold himself into slavery to another. <laughs> Adam sold us all into slavery to another. And one by one, the hope is, is that all of us, sons and daughters, will awaken and come to ourselves and arise and go back to the father. That's the plan. And the way God does that is by giving us the law. And he shows us how far away we are according to the mirror of the law. That's how he does it. So we finally uh, come to ourselves and realize it. Well, we wouldn't if there wasn't for the darkness, the pain, the sin, the consequences of sin, right? But God, he, it's not his will that any perish, is what the Bible says, but that all comes to repentance, to a change of mind. And we got to get roughed up, it seems like. Some of us more than others. <laughs> we just got to get roughed up a while yeah. until we finally say that's enough. So, and I, I think the ultimate point is, is that one day when we shed this body, we get a new body and we're forever in an eternal kingdom state, there will be no darkness. And whatever rebellion we had in us is <clears throat> long gone. Because in heaven there's not going to be any more. There's not going to be any more falling out with Lucifer and his jealousy or his selfish ambition. It's all going to be gone because the only people there are going to say, make me your slave. Yeah. We're always going to, we're going to realize that it's not us, but it's all him. Wow, that's so, good. so there won't be any in the corner going, hey, I think we can do a better job than he does. Yeah. He's going to put an end to it once and for all. Mm. Okay. So Romans... 5.15 says, But the free gift is not like the transgression. 
For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So, what struck me just now is, if you look back at Romans 5.10, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the the death of Christ reconciles us, but God, Christ resurrected and ascended life in us is our salvation. See, the death reconciles, but his life, his very life, is much more than just reconciliation. It says several times here, much more, much more. Yeah. See, he's saying what we had in Adam is nothing compared to the much more of what we have in Christ. It's a much more proposition (laughs) oh you think that's great well there's much more (laughs) there's always much more god's always got much more there's more (laughs) that's right super size (laughs) yeah but wait yeah yeah you would pay 19.99 for this but wait (laughs) there's much more (laughs) that's right this reminds me of You know, when we have communion, if we ever do, I don't remember the last time I did around here, but anyway, that's beside the point. So there is. Uh, oh, okay. So we have two elements, though, in in uh, communion, right? You have wine and bread, or juice and and bread, or blood and body, right? And Jesus said, "Do this in remembrance of me." Now, I've got a little quiz. What does the blood do? What is the, what is the blood for? The drink. What? The blood, Christ's blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. All right, now I've got a better question. What's the bread or the body for? What is it? New life. New life. The blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. The body was broken and killed or crucified to deal with the sinner. The blood was shed for the deeds of misbehavior, the sins. The body was given to take out the producer of those sins. See, it's not just that we're washed off. It's that we were crucified with him. See? that the body of sin might be done away with. (laughs) So he didn't just whack off branches. He uprooted the tree. So we become a new person. So I I, I find it fascinating, though, because I'd be willing to bet you if you went up to just about anybody today or in the next few weeks that you run into that is a believer and you asked them what the bread is for, most won't be able to tell you. You just don't hear it taught. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's been hidden all along. Yeah. There's another thing, too. The bloodshed is Jesus' work 100% all by himself. His blood, not any of our blood, was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. But the body part is where we're joined. See, that's how we get to play a part in this. That's how we're connected to it because we were crucified with him we were placed in him right crucified buried and raised back in him so the body part is is including us we don't get to participate in the forgiveness of our sins or in the forgiveness of others sins but we are participating in the fact that we died and were crucified and raised back to walk in new life we're no longer the old man in Adam. That's what we're going to 
get into in Romans 6. But Adam brought in death to all mankind. So death spread to everybody, right? Jesus came along and he's offering life, life <laughs> and righteousness and justification, holiness, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, self-control. All of those things are all balled up into him. Come to me, come to me. So one by one, we have to come to him. We have to individually put our faith in him to be brought out of this death trap that Adam brought us into. I always look, I remember sharing one time that this is called splitting atoms. <laughs> so we have the first atom and the last atom. And you know what happens when you split an atom? Boom. <laughs> the atomic bomb is what happens when you split. <laughs> so the cross is splitting atoms. It's the most powerful weapon ever. More powerful than Hiroshima. <laughs> More powerful than what blew up, you know, over there. Whoa! This is this is completely severing us from our sinful old boss and joining us to our righteous new boss. Much more. Much more. So look in Romans five eighteen. It says, "So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men." For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. Amen. That's <laughs> so great. Yeah. I, I just love that because it's so simple. Yeah. It's just so simple. I mean, we get it all confused and mixed up, and we're all tore up about all, well, I got my rights, and I have free will, and you, you know, there's all these things. And it's like, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Yeah. God. God is not sitting black and white, Jews and Gentiles and all of these different cultures and colors and languages. That's not how he's looking at it. He's looking at mankind. He's going, there's a bunch of people on this planet that I created to walk around in my image, and they're not there yet. They're walking around with a damaged representation of who I am in Adam because of sin. But through my son, Jesus Christ, the exact representation of who I am, they can be reborn, and the image of God can be restored in them. That's what I'm after. Get out of Adam and get into my son. Yeah. How do we do that? The cross. Faith. And the world will offer you everything except that. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking about this this morning. There are a lot of philosophers and deep thinking people that you can run across online or on TV. And I mean, it is such a great deception. They're, they're promising all this enlightenment and all of this deep understanding of who you are and the world around you. But it is crossless. And I'm telling you, there's no path to that without the cross. Without the cross, there's no real enlightenment. There's no real awakening. All it's going to do is elevate you back to Godhood status apart from Christ. That's antichrist. That's total deception. That's the lie from the beginning. If you partake of this, you'll be as God. And the world's full of people like that. Oprah Winfrey! <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I can just name a bunch of them because I've actually listened and read a lot of this stuff, and I and I'm amazed at the, how great the deception is. Yeah. They are sharp, man. These people are sharp. Yeah. But the Bible says that Satan even comes as an angel of light, and that why wouldn't his ministers also come as an angel? So there is there's some good deceptions out there, some great counterfeit. So I would say if it doesn't have a cross in it, you need to reject it. Exactly. Because without a death, burial, and resurrection, without suffering, there is no glory. Yeah. Without death and burial, there can be no resurrection. Right. So when people start offering you something, elevated understanding, deeper understanding, being awakened, oh, all this wonderful flowery stuff, but there's no Jesus and no cross, run. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to run. All right, so look at Romans 5, verse 20. Somebody read that verse. God's law was given so that all people could, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful. Wow, that is a very interesting translation. Yeah. That's very because that is kind of explaining it more than, so, somebody read a different version. That's good, but that kind of took the shock value away from what I was wanting you to see. There 